Good evening and welcome to Lighthouse for Jesus Tuesday Night Bible Study. And we are uh, studying a series entitled The Gospel According to the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, today we will be uh, quickly discussing the Sabbath and what it means in, uh, re regarding the tabernacle. And we're going to talk about the offerings and the builders of the tabernacle. Hopefully we can get through that. Uh, and I would give a subtitle to this lesson and it would be what do you have to give? What do you have to give? And, uh, but before we get to uh, the Sabbath, I had not, there were a couple of scriptures last night, I'm sorry, last week that we did not finish. And I feel like we need to read them. Uh, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Luke 24 and I'm going to read the 27th verse and then I'm going to go to verses 44 through 48 and Sister Tiffany if you would read John 5 and 39 and then go to 45 and 46. Uh, everyone who ha is taking notes, uh, you can write down Acts 3, 18 through 25. Acts 3, 18 through 25. And uh, I'm going to begin reading Luke 24 right now. And verse 27 states, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And then verses 44 through 48. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things. And with what we were talking about last week, why study the tabernacle? These were some scriptures that uh, we didn't have time to read. And these are the things that Jesus himself spoke uh, and, in, uh, and Luke wrote. And it is telling us that Jesus expounded the scriptures to his disciples and he expounded concerning the things that were about him. That is the gospel, Jesus Christ, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and those scriptures that he expounded to them in the Old Testament were about him. And then in verses uh, 44 through 48, he is telling them that not only what Moses wrote, but what the prophets wrote, what was written in the Psalms, those things that were written about him. Verse 45, he opened their understanding about the scriptures. Again, the scriptures, and he said unto them about the scriptures, that it was written about him, about Jesus Christ. Those scriptures from the Old Testament, that it was about him suffering, him rising from the dead. 
and that in that that gospel there should be repentance and remission of sins and it should be preached in his name so he's telling them the scriptures that he's giving all of this to them about is from the old testament i find that to be remarkable okay and now john 5 sister tiffany john 5 and 39 and then 45 and 30 45 and 46. search the scripture for in them you think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and down to verse 45 uh-huh do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed him, for he wrote of me. Okay, and I'm just going to read verse 47. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall you believe my word? So, if you're going to believe... If you say we believe... If we say we believe in Jesus, he's saying... If you don't believe what Moses wrote, Old Testament, it's all a part. The whole book, guys, we cannot take parts of it out. And again, in uh, verse 39, he says, search the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and you will find him. They testify of him. And also, there is eternal life in those scriptures. If we read with understanding and revelation with the spirit of god in us to show us what is there so and i said the uh the other scripture was acts 3 18 through 25 that you could read when you have time okay uh also uh we're gonna go to numbers i didn't see brother rogers he's not there sister tiffany Here. Can you read uh, number 17, verses 7 and 8, please, Brother Rogers? Okay. Number 17 and 7. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds okay what i wanted to get out of that is that uh the tabernacle was to be a witness to the nations around them and sometimes it was called the tabernacle of witness. And uh, we are told in uh, Acts 1 and 8, I'm going to quickly read that. Uh, Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So, the tabernacle of God, where God's presence, presence dwelt with his people, was to be a witness to the other nations. We are the tabernacles the temples of God, and we should be witnesses to everyone around us. The power that we receive, we always look at it as power to work miracles or to cast out demons, but power to become witnesses. So to be a witness is not just to quote scriptures. To be a witness is to live a life where it looks as if the Spirit of God is dwelling within you, okay? That is, and that requires power. 
That requires power. Okay, so we're going to go to Exodus 35. With, we're going to start with the Sabbath here. Exodus 35. Uh, and Sister Tiffany, <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. I need you to go to Exodus 31 and read verses 12 through 17. And Brother Rogers, go to Exodus 35 and read verses one through three. So first we have 31, 12 through 17 and 35, one through three. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak thou also unto the children of Israel saying, Verily my Sabbaths shall ye keep, sh ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay, and then we go to Exodus 35, 1 through 3. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord had commanded that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be no, there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Okay, so why did we read that? Hmm? Well, at the end of God giving Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle, uh, God reminded them of the Sabbath and when we compare chapters 25 through 31 with chapters 35 through 40, well, we know 25 through 31, those chapters are where Moses is being given the instruction, the pattern, the revelation of the tabernacle, 35 through 40, that would be the chapters that give us the constructing of it. And so in Exodus 31, we see the first portion ending with instructions regarding to keep the Sabbath. And so the, the, the part where there's construction going on of the tabernacle, it begins with rules for the Sabbath, reminding them that this was the sign of the covenant and it was very significant that they observed this day. And uh, I believe that it was put there so that those who were doing the work would not use building the tabernacle as an excuse not to observe the Sabbath. They might think, well, this I'm doing this for God, so it doesn't matter. And I think we have that kind of mindset sometimes where we think that because we're doing it for God, they will be building the tabernacle for God. But he said, you still observe that Sabbath. So they, he wanted to remind them at the end of one thing and at the beginning of the other. Uh, God's 
instructions here, uh, not just regarding the Sabbath, but everything that Moses said. We're going to see that uh, they're carried out to the letter. God spent a lot of ink on revealing what to do and then telling us how they did it so that we would know that they did what he told them to do. Okay, so now we're going to get into the offerings are what I would call, what do you have to give? Uh, we're going to go to Exodus 25, one through nine, Sister Tiffany. And then we're going to go to Exodus 35, 4 through 9, Brother Rogers. So, Sister Tiffany. Exodus 29. Which verses? Exodus 25, uh, verses 1 through 9. Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering, of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skin and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Okay, and now we go to 35, four through nine. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, this is a thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen of, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shit and wood, and all for the light, and spices for anointing oil, and for the sweet incenses and the onyx stone and, and stones to set for the ephod and for the breastplate. Okay. And we see these passages are almost identical. They are identical in what they're saying, but the placement of certain items are in different places. But here we see, again, how important this is to God because he has, the, he has it so clear for us in the instructions he gives to Moses and so clear to us in Moses obeying and doing what uh, God told him to do. So, as I said before, I would subtitle this, what do you have to give? Uh, so, now it's time for God to do what he originally planned. And what he uh, originally commanded Moses to do regarding the building of the tabernacle and the items associated with the tabernacle. Uh, God commanded an offering. He told uh, Moses to tell them that, he, that there was an offering to be given. And God did not start off telling Moses what it was for, although I'm sure Moses had an idea. But he told Moses, he just told him, get an offering, take an offering. Now, you know, God can tell our leaders to take special offerings. We'll get more into that later. <laughs> but God wanted Israel to be motivated by a willing heart more than by a specific need. Remember, I stated last week that uh, after God delivered Israel, and formed them as a nation, gave them his laws and his precepts, not all of them, but just the beginning of them. Um, in, 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 in molding them into a nation, the first thing he did was to 
call for an offer. So he wanted it to be done because of a willing heart. And our giving should not primarily be because of need. That's, that's a good reason to give, but primarily it should be because our hearts want to give. Because our willing heart compels us to give. God is a rich God. God owns everything and everybody. And he can use any method to provide what he wants or he needs. Or that we need. Yet he usually uses the willing hearts of his people to support his work. All the materials for the building of the tabernacles were to be supplied by the people. Nobody else, the people. This offering came from God's command, not from Moses. God told Moses to get the offering. He did not tell Moses to have a fundraiser. Y'all know we like fundraisers. I am a fundraiser queen. And we know that uh, many churches would not have survived without fundraisers. But God's primary way that he wants us to support his work is by giving. That's the primary, okay? He wants us to, to do it. So God channeled those resources to do his work. And uh, even though he could have caused uh, the money and the materials to just appear, by a miracle, that is not what he chose to do. Uh, he works that way because he wants his people to be conformed to his image. And he is a great giver. John 3 and 16 says that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that is giving. And to be conformed to his image, then that uh, are not conformed to the world, but conformed to him or uh, to be formed, to, to take on his attributes, we need to want to give. To be in, made into the image of God. So he's saying to Moses to get an offering. He doesn't want coercion. He doesn't want manipulation. He wants willing hearts. And he said, you shall get my offering. It is his offering. It is God's offering. It is not Moses' offering. It belongs to the Lord. Moses was holding it on God's behalf. So, Each of those materials that we read about were used in building the tabernacle that God commanded Moses to build. Each of those things that we read about, that we just read, uh, all these things, uh, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple, all of those things, have a symbolic and a spiritual meaning, a spiritual representation that's relevant to the building and each material represents a spiritual truth. These are not just things. These are types and shadows. Everything God does, everything that God says has a spiritual significance. Uh, so God is expressing his truth in the materials that he uses for his tabernacle. He moves from the lower to the higher level. He moves from the ritual to reality. He moves from the shadow to the substance. 
he moves from the symbol to the spiritual truth, from the natural to the spiritual. So in the proportion of the finished tab tabernacle, the present day value of these items here, depending on who you, are, you ask, would cost anywhere from 30 to 100 million dollars in today's economy. Those things that they use in weight would come to about 19,000 to 20,000 pounds. Now, this is significant because they had to carry this everywhere they went in the wilderness. Those 19 to 20,000 pounds. God also used three natural categories or three kingdoms that he got these, that he wanted these uh, items from. So the, the, the kingdoms are categories that he gets them from. We're going to begin with mineral. He has items from the mineral kingdom. At first, I was going to go over each one in detail to give its significance, but no, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to give you the items, but as we use them to build the tabernacle, then we're going to talk about their meaning and uh, how, where they came from, all of that, okay? So, but those those uh, materials that came from the mineral kingdom are gold, silver, brass, precious stone. Those are all from the mineral kingdom. These are minerals found within the earth. Then he used the plant kingdom. From the plant kingdom, we have the fine linen. Because the fine linen comes from flax. That is a plant. And we have the shittim wood, a plant, a tree. Okay? Oil for the lamp. That comes from, the olive oil comes from a plant. Spices for the anointing oil. Uh, these also are going to come from plants. And spices for the sweet incense, again, from the plant kingdom. And then he gives us uh, materials from the animal kingdom, the blue. Now, I wonder if anybody wondered about that. He just gave us some colors, blue and purple and scarlet. How do you give those colors? Actually, these uh, colors are extracted from different animals, different kinds of animals. So blue and purple and scarlet. Those are from the animal kingdom, those colors. And those colors were, were put into threads to embroider or be woven into the, uh, the fine linen to put all these colors in the tabernacle. And then we have goat's hair, we have ram skin dyed red, and we have badger skin. All of those are from the animal kingdom. As I said before, as we're going through the construction of the tabernacle, we will discuss each and every one of those things. We're also going to study the numbers used in the tabernacle and the multiples of those numbers, which intensify the meaning as used in the tabernacle. And we will be so blessed by what God is teaching us in the building of the tabernacle. In the last verse of each of these, he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the divine purpose of the tabernacle was to be the dwelling place of God. 
That's the key thought of everything that pertains to the tabernacle. God's desire is to dwell in the midst of his redeemed people, but on his own terms and on his own grounds. The idea wasn't that God was just going to exclusively live in the tabernacle, but it was a specific place where God could meet his people, where men could go and meet with God. Sanctuary means a holy place or a place set apart. Everything about the tabernacle was holy. We have a sanctuary. We call it the sanctuary of strength. Do we really treat the sanctuary as a holy place? Do we treat the sanctuary as a place that has been set apart as a place for God to dwell. And I'm talking about the building. Do we have the respect and the reverence that we should have as a place where God dwells? And then we come to our own bodies because we are also temples of God or tabernacles of God. Do we act as if we are a holy place or a place set apart for God? Or have we forgotten that? So God follows the pronouncement of why he wants to build this tabernacle or a place that he could dwell among his people by giving them a pattern that is to be followed in the construction of his dwelling place. This first representation of God's dwelling would be uh, a tent tabernacle, not a permanent structure, because, well, the, the word tabernacle, our Hebrew mishkan, appears for the first time here. Uh, it's going to appear 139 times altogether in the Old Testament, but it is from the word to dwell, or sakan, and it's the place where God dwells among his people. God wanted the Israelites, he wanted them to feel that God was their fellow pilgrim, that where they pitched, he pitched, and where they went, he went, and that their enemies would become his enemies. Their difficulties would be his difficulties. The marches that they were on, he was marching with them. No matter how long the way was, no matter how hard the trip was, no matter what trouble they had, no matter what battles they had to fight, he wanted them to know that he was right there in the midst of them. And do we know that if we are truly saved, and even when we're not, God is there. He says, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishing. So from reading this, it's apparent that God uh, not only described the tabernacle and its furnishing to Moses, but that he showed it to Moses. At least something of it, its structure, its arrangement, there was a vision that accompanied the giving of these words. The pattern of the tabernacle was according to a heavenly reality. In Hebrews 8 and 5, it tells us it was a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So what was built on earth reflected what was in heaven already. So it had to be made according to the exact dimension so that it could be a scale model of what was in heaven. So the pattern means an architect's model. We also need to realize that God did not give the pattern to the people. He gave it to the leader. He gave it to Moses. And Moses passed it on down to the people. We need to be careful when we feel that God is giving 
us a pattern to something without it being told to our leader. That, you know, we're always talking about uh, how God likes order, you know, and sometimes the people who say God likes order so much are the ones who are so out of order. If God shows us something, he's going to show it to our leader as well. Or at least his spirit will bear witness to that, but he does not have to skip over the leader to get to us. Right, guys? Okay. Do I still have some friends? Uh, God made a dwelling place for man when he created the earth. And as I said before, only two chapters give us all of that, the vastness of the universe. And we have so many about the tabernacle. And scientists spend lifetimes studying and exploring the mysteries and the wonders of the earth. But greater than those mysteries is the mystery and the wonder of God's dwelling place, the tabernacle. And God is going to, uh, to take us uh, in deeper places when we get to the tabernacle of Moses and uh, the temple of Solomon uh, because where he dwells is so important for us to know. Uh, a wealth of knowledge and truth and spiritual riches are hidden in the revelation of the tabernacle. Now we're going to go to chapter 30, um, 35 of Exodus. Let me just get 35. There I am. And I'm going to go to verse 10. So that's Exodus 35, verse 10. And I'm going to read that one and I'm going to go to verse 19. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tashes, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves, and all his vessels, and the showbread the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, his staves and all his vessels, the labor and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the clothes of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. Now, this lists the items that must be made from the materials that were offered uh, so these he's telling them what has to be made there now it says that every wise hearted among you which means everybody who was skillful or who uh, was gifted as an artisan who could uh, build and, and, and create. All of these people were supposed to come forth and make all that the Lord commanded. Uh, when we look at this, we notice that the word, the pronoun his, is used over and over again. Speaking of the fact that all of this is made for God, but it goes deeper than that because if you will look at something like uh, 
where it says, and the incense altar in verse 15, and his staves. Here, he's calling the incense altar his. When it says the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, his staves, his vessels, the labor and his foot, meaning the foot goes with the labor, the grate and the staves and the vessels go with the altar of burnt offering. So not only is God saying this whole thing is him, he is saying, he is giving in a sense a, a name to the furniture in the tabernacle. The, the the incense altar is a his or is a him. The the brazen altar is a him. The uh, brazen labor is a him and has his own things to go with it. And so that to me is so beautiful of him letting us know that this is all about him. This is all about Jesus. And it's also very interesting that in these offerings that they are bringing and in all these things that they have to make, they also have to make the clothes or the garments for the priest to wear. It was a part of the holy things of God, the garments that the priests would wear to do their service, to minister in the priest's office, that there was a certain kind of clothing that they were supposed to wear. All of this becomes more and more important as we go along. You couldn't just go in there any dress any kind of way. It still applies today. We're talking about this is the gospel according to the tabernacle of Moses. This is about us as well. And we need to ask ourselves as we go on here, are we who have so much more revelation, are we doing what God wants us to do, not just for the tabernacle, but in the tabernacle of God, in the place of separation, in the holy place. Okay, so now we're going to go to Exodus 35, 20 through 29. Sister Tiffany, if you would read that one, 20 through 29. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came every one whose heart stirred him up and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. How far should I read? Um, you should go to 29. Okay. And they came both men and women, as many as were willing hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, uh, that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise hearted did wise hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in the in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring 
for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Praise God for that. Now, when we read verse 10, it says, every wise hearted, that someone who was skillful in those things. Uh, now, this portion uh, is not in uh, chapter 25 because uh, this is the response of Israel after they were told to bring the offering. Uh, so it says, well, I, all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. So once they knew what they had to do, it says that they departed from the presence of Moses. After Moses asked them to give, he let them go home. And think about what they had to give, what they would give. There was absolutely no manipulation on the part of Moses. He didn't have a contest. He didn't do any of those things. He didn't see which tribe could raise the most or whatever. Sometimes God just wants us to give to him because our hearts are willing. Willing heart. As we go through these verses, it says a heart stirred up. The ones who came, their hearts were stirred up. That means their hearts were lifted up for God. Their spirits were made willing. They were willing hearted. Wise hearted. Their hearts were stirred up in wisdom. Again, it says they were willing. They gave a willing offering and their hearts were made willing. This is so important. We see those words over and over again. Over and over again. The Lord's offering. Free will offering. So their hearts were, were willing. They really didn't know what to give, when to give, or how to give it until Moses led them. So they had to be told when there was a need and how they could meet that need. And the fact that they were giving it to the Lord in Moses' hands. It says both men and women. It says every man with whom was found. If you had it, you gave it. If you had blue and purple and scarlet, if you had acacia or shittim wood, that's the same thing. The women whose hearts were stirred, who, who were going to do the, the weaving and all of those things, and the rulers brought the onyx stone. So it seems from the words that are used that almost everybody in Israel gave something, not just the wealthy, but everyone who had a willing heart, they brought something to give. If you couldn't give a precious jewel, maybe you could give some goat's hair. Maybe you could weave an embroider because he wasn't just asking for materials. He was also asking for service. He was asking for work to be done. And no matter, what work they did, the people of God, nobody asked to get paid. No matter how gifted they were and what they were doing for this special need of the tabernacle being built. Of course, there were other times when their giving was not for something like this because God requires both kinds of giving, just the voluntary offering and the mandatory. God requires. But here he's starting with the uh, voluntary. He wants to get their hearts right. Because if we, uh, uh, if we truly love God in our hearts, 
then it's going to show in our giving. Everybody had a chance to give something, to give what they could. And all of it was welcome in God's sight. Everything was welcome in God's sight. So now let us go to 35. 30, Brother Rogers, uh, verses, no, I'm sorry, not 35, 31. 1 through 11. Exodus 31, 1 through 11. Yes, Exodus 31, 1 through 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of her of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to, de to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Ahaliab, the son of Hasamach of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of and in the hearts of all that are wise, wise hearted have I put wisdom that they may, they may that they may make all that I have commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the laver and his foot, and the clothes of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing all and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. Okay, and now we go to Exodus 35, 30 through 35, Sister Tiffany. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in the cutting of stones, to set them in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. Dan, them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple in scarlet and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. Okay, so we see there again, we read first the instructions of the revelation of what was to be done. And then uh, we read of uh, Moses getting the builders ready to do the work. So God called by name the contractors for this building project. He, uh, he equipped them with a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit to do this work. They were artisans to begin with, extremely gifted, but God needed more than just natural gifting. He needed the power of God to be in them, them and upon them when they did the work. Just as God chose Moses and Aaron to be leaders, he also specifically chose these craftsmen for his service. God equips those he calls. So he supernaturally enabled Bezal to do the work of building the tabernacle. And God saw this work as spiritual as well as what Moses and Aaron were doing. And that work also was dependent upon the power of God. Just as any work we do for God, 
depends upon the power of God. There is nothing so, so small when we are working for God that it does not require his power to help us to do it. Bezalel's name, name means in the shadow of God. His father's name, Uri, means light or splendor. And the name her means free. So Jesus was reflected in these names. He uh, uh, was, he, he, he uh, is the brightness, the light of the world. He's anointed to set people free. Bethlehem was also of the tribe of Judah, which means praise. And Jesus, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he alone is worthy to receive praise. And I can't think of a better way to praise God than to just build his tabernacle. It reminded me when I was reading this of when we were remodeling our sanctuary and how God gifted the hand of the young people and the older people to do everything, uh, well, not everything, but so many of the things that needed to be done to beautify it. And that is what happens when God gives a vision to a leader and the people without question follow the vision of that leader. I think we need to think about that today in our giving. The other man involved in the building of the tabernacle was Aholiab. And uh, he was the son of Ahissamah. His name means tabernacle of my father. And Ahissamah, his name means brother of support. So again, Jesus is reflected in those names of the people that he chose. And God put wisdom in their hearts and he put uh, power in their hearts. Uh, as we go on with this, we did get a lot of scriptures read today, tonight. As we go on with this, we're going to have to finish this part next week. We will also go to the New Testament and see how the principles of the way God wants his people to give, how those principles still are for us today because he gives us instructions on our hearts when we give and we need to want to give more and more to the work of God and we're going to talk more about that next week how this applies to us today whatever we have whatever success or prosperity we may have it is not ours it belongs to god and we ought to be trying we ought to be trying to find ways to give more to the work of god so we're going to stop right here